AI seems to be everywhere. It's authoring novels and passing exams. It's creating art and driving cars. It's even attempted to seduce journalists. Yet one question has been on my mind. Can AI music truly replace the music producers of today? In search of answers, I plunged into an exploration of music's history and the tech that has shaped it. From the birth of the player piano to modern day AI music. And this journey has made one thing clear. When it comes down to new tech, musicians haven't always been welcoming. I'm sure you know this music, the famous Stars and Stripes Forever, a classic echoing from football games to band practices across America. But do you know the man behind it? Meet John Philip Sousa. While his name may not ring much bells today, in the peak of his career, he was an absolute legend. Born in 1854, Sousa began his journey with the United States Marine Band. But over time, his legacy only grew, with a career that eventually spanned five decades and over 150 compositions. From the rise of the player piano to the advent of recorded music, Sousa witnessed it all. And he absolutely hated it. You see, John grew up in a time when having access to music was much more of a privilege than it is today. You couldn't just open up Spotify and suddenly have millions of songs at your fingertips. Back then, on-demand music meant you either played it yourself, had personal connections with a musician, or were ready to pay a premium for it. That all changed though with those first few audio recordings from Thomas Edison. Now sound wasn't just something that happened in the moment. We had a way to capture, record, and play back anything we wanted. To John, however, recorded audio was anything but a revolution. You see, in 1906, he wrote an essay titled The Menace of Mechanical Music, an extensive 4,000 word critique against the rising popularity of the player piano and recording music itself. His belief was that these recordings diminished the true essence of the art form. He also claimed that its quality would simply never match that of a live musician and that this new tech will eventually lead to music being abandoned altogether, leaving many of his fellow musicians out of jobs. Now, his fear was partly due to the lack of proper copyright laws. In fact, his essay played a part in shaping the Copyright Act of 1909. But it's important to remember that John wasn't alone here. And history is filled with musicians having to adapt to a changing world. You see, when we continue on through music history, you start noticing that almost every single new innovation has also brought with it pushback from those who are already established within it. Take for example jukeboxes and the radio, invented by Louis Glass, William S. Arnold, and Guglielmo Marconi. These were a boom for on-demand and at-home music. Bars and restaurants were now able to play any music they wanted, regardless of a live band, leading to a much greater variety in sound. However, some touring musicians did not like this idea because to them, it would mean less of a demand for live bookings. And while yes, some places would cut down the number of live acts, the musicians who adapted used this mass distribution to their advantage. Benny Goodman, Tommy Dorsey, Billie Holiday, Frank Sinatra, and Elvis Presley, just to name a few, they all recognized the enormous potential here and they capitalized on it. Not only that, but this easy access to music arguably paved the way for the very idea of pop culture itself. All thanks to these trailblazers who used new tech to their advantage. Then along comes the 1950s, where we see the move from analog to digital. This era brought the very first tape-based multi-track system, which was developed by audio engineer Les Paul. This allowed recording engineers to record and mix multiple audio tracks onto a single tape, which was a major departure from the industry standard single track recordings. Not long after, he invented the pulverizer for use in his live shows. This custom-built device allowed Les Paul to create the illusion of multiple guitars playing at once by recording and looping back his live performance in real time. Audiences loved it and the impact of this technology changed the music industry forever. Synthesizers followed not long after this, when in 1964, Robert Moog debuted the very first analog synth, the Moog Modular. Now with this new form of tech, producers could replicate any sound of any instrument they wanted by using voltage control oscillators, filters, and envelope generators. This led to an explosion of new genres and techniques simply not possible in the eras before. However, to a lot of existing musicians who played physical instruments, 
This new tech was seen as a threat to their income, so much so that the largest labor union in music, the American Federation of Musicians, managed to successfully restrict any commercial recordings that used the Moog synth. You see, the AFM had the power to negotiate and enforce contracts between their musicians and producers. And as part of these contracts, they often set restrictions on the types of instruments that could actually be used. In the case of the Moog synth, members of the AFM believed that the use of synthesizers threatened the jobs of traditional studio musicians. Now, the restriction was eventually lifted in the 1970s, as the sheer popularity of synths became too big to ignore. But it still shows how oftentimes musicians tend to fear any new tech that can be seen as a replacement for their own. By the time the 70s were winding down and the 80s was on the horizon, we saw yet another advancement in music tech. One that led to an explosion of new sounds, and one that was crucial for the early days of a brand new genre of music, hip hop. In 1979, we saw the release of the very first commercially successful sampler, the Fairlight CMI. The Fairlight was a digital sampling synth that allowed musicians to record and manipulate real world sounds. However, it was very expensive, and with a price tag of over $25,000, it was only really affordable to top tier recording studios or wealthy musicians. So it took more advancements in tech to bring down the cost, so the average musician could actually take advantage of it. This became a reality starting in 1987, when EMU Systems released the SP-1200, which saw mass adoption throughout hip hop's golden age. This device was the first of its kind, as not only could it sample, but it had the ability to construct the bulk of an entire song within one piece of portable gear, all at an affordable price of only $2,500. Sampling and interpolation was used extensively by early hip-hop artists like Grandmaster Flash, Run DMC, Houdini, and Curtis Blow. Of course, we can't forget to mention Sugar Hill Gang and their seminal hit, Rapper's Delight, which interpolated Good Times by Sheik. However, some musicians and industry professionals argued that using samples was a form of cheating or plagiarism, and that it was not a legitimate way to create music. This drove not only a cultural divide between hip-hop and other genres, but also led to extensive court cases and litigation over the use of samples. Despite the controversy though, samplers have become an important tool in almost every genre of music today, and most DAWs have built-in samplers that any musician with a PC can use right out of the box. Gone are the days of needing to spend 25 k just for the privilege of sampling audio. Now it takes only a few clicks on your computer. So what do all these stories have in common? And what does this have to do with AI? Well, they show that technology has a way of lowering the barrier of entry when it comes down to music, which leads to even more musicians and thus even more music variety. If it wasn't for the synth, we wouldn't have had electronic music. And if it wasn't for samplers, we wouldn't have had hip hop. Producers today could have a full orchestra with one device. This is all thanks to technology getting cheaper and easier to produce to the point more and more people can get involved in production. This is why many producers today look at AI as just another tool and how there's really nothing to fear. But is that really true? I saw a question about um, emergent drums and like uh, if you generate samples. Oh yeah, big room what house. The... Yes, that's what that's what one person was asking about. Yeah. So if you generate samples with emergent drums, you own them, and uh, some people, for instance generate samples out of emergent drums and sell the sample packs that they make. Right. You know, maybe they maybe they do a little post processing and whatever, or maybe not, but they, they just put them in some some sample packs and sell them. Mm. Um, so our thing about the future is that like <clears throat> this, like a sense of scarcity should re should disappear from creative the creative process. That right there is Berkeley Maligon, CEO of a brand new VST called Emergent Drums which uses AI to generate an infinite amount of drum samples. It can provide one-shots, kicks, hi-hats, snares, or even entire drum kits, all custom-made in a matter of seconds. However, Berkeley is not alone here, and he's a part of a growing trend of plugin developers using AI to help with songwriting and music production. AI plugins today can be used to generate melodies, chord progressions, isolate audio, mix and master tracks, and can even sing synthesized vocals. And yet still, this technology is always evolving, further lowering the barrier of entry to even become a musician. 
and making many aspects of music production easier. Let's take synthesized vocals for a second. Recently, a song with AI vocals made headlines across the music industry after racking up millions of plays across TikTok, Spotify, YouTube, and other streaming platforms. Called Heart on My Sleeve, it featured an AI synthesized Drake and The Weeknd with a near perfect replication of both their lyrical style and voices. However, contrary to what most of the general population thinks, the song was not entirely AI generated. It still required a talented producer to make the beat. Further, the vocals weren't 100% artificial. It required a human singer to get an initial recording. This recording was then passed through an AI cloning service to replace the timbre of the original singer into Drake's. Here's a short snippet from Aiden Kenway who replicated how this was done. I highly recommend checking out the full video after this. So we're going to be uploading those vocals to an AI generator, which will convert the timbre of my voice into the likes of Drake. Once again, I definitely don't condone using this service. This is merely an educational video, and I don't want to promote this at all to anyone who doesn't want to get sued. So I uploaded my vocals, ran it through the program, downloaded it, and that's going to sound like this. I came in with my ex. Flex a lead, not a flex. Ay. Bumping Justin Bieber, but I fear I ain't left. Ay. She know what she need, oh I need. Drake, of course, wasn't happy after this went viral, and it was shortly pulled by Universal Music Group, citing copyright law, but also by taking a moral high ground stance by referencing being on the side of artists, fans, and human creative expression. However, not only three months later, it appears UMG is softened up to the tech, just as long as they get compensated. As reported by the Financial Times, they're now in talks with Google to not only create an official tool for AI cloning, but also a way to license their artists' voices. As we saw with the rise of sampling, I expect a repeat of history here as new laws get established to make AI vocals more legitimized. Now AI and synth vocals are not new. In fact, the technology has been around for far longer than you would think. But frankly, it's too much to cover here. I plan on doing a separate video looking at the history of that tech, so subscribe to stay up to date on whenever I get around to it. Of course, synth and AI vocals also present their own problems. If you can clone an artist's voice for your song, you can really get them to say whatever you want. The potential for misinformation, paired with the recent advances in video deepfakes, means that we're entering a new paradigm of society, where it'll be even harder to tell the real from the unreal. Regardless, where does that bring us? It's clear AI is already here, and music producers are already adopting portions of it in their workflows. So what does that mean for the future? What does that mean when these tools become so good that it can make music production itself trivial? Now, when people talk about AI music, they usually mean fully AI generated tracks with no human involvement. Similar to the likes of Mid Journey or Stable Diffusion in the art world, where an AI can create original music from nothing but simple text. This would have sounded like sci-fi not only a year ago, but now, it's already here. This is Music LM from Google. It's an AI model capable of creating original song snippets based on prompts. Think of it as the Dali of music. I've been putting it through its paces to test it out, and if I'm being honest with you, it's far from perfect. Here's a couple of examples I generated just so you can get an idea of what it's capable of.
Clearly, this isn't going to be winning any Grammys, but this is the worst it'll ever be. Further, the way these models are designed is they continually improve. As users generate tracks with Musical M, they are asked to award which one of them is best, meaning that as time goes on, the quality will increase. And Google isn't alone here. Meta AI has been making waves in the open source community by enabling artists and musicians to generate not only AI music, but now most recently, AI sound effects, all local and off of consumer hardware. This is all done by their AudioCraft library, which anyone can download today. Similar to Musical M, its AI music is clearly in its infancy, but the AI sound effects it can generate are nothing short of amazing. Here's a short collection of what it's capable of with text prompts alone. Not bad, eh? And while for now it's obvious that AI music won't be hitting the Billboard Top 100, I think with a bit of improvement it can certainly find its place when it comes down to background music. And unfortunately, background music and Foley sound effects still make up a good portion of many musicians' incomes. And given how restrictive our copyright system is, many small-time creators will most likely gravitate towards products just like this, enabling them to have 100% original music and never needing to worry about copyright strikes or licensing fees. This actually leads into a much larger problem the music industry will likely face. Basic supply and demand. Music is a commodity, and like every commodity, its value is dictated by supply and demand. In the past, when musicians were much more rare, this demanded a greater cost for their services. Now, thanks to technology, there is a countless number of producers out there that you can hire for any number of projects, all for a relatively cheap fee. This is a good thing. Music should not be in the realm of the few who can afford it. And having access to so many options means that no matter the budget, you can always find someone that can fit the bill. Tech has enabled all of this. So let's look at the near future as AI improves and that same tech gets even cheaper. Nowadays, you no longer need dedicated hardware for sampling, as this functionality is directly integrated into every DAW. So, we can probably expect a similar situation with generative AI. FL Studio's image line has already shown they are working with a variation of AI tech to split a master recording into multiple components. Given how fast these models are moving and the plummeting cost of consumer hardware, it's not out of the realm of possibility that we will eventually see a world where you can highlight eight bars in your track enter a text prompt, and then have the DAW generate that musical component for you. Something like this would be very powerful in the hands of a producer. This does, however, significantly change the landscape of the music economy. You see, many producers today have multiple income streams. And while most of the general public thinks that musicians primarily make their money off of streaming and touring, today there exists an entire sub-economy where artists sell sample packs, do sound design tutorials, teach, or make royalty-free tracks. In the age of AI, where anyone can generate music, this landscape is totally different. We can expect sample pack and audio resale services like Splice to increasingly be flooded with AI content. We're already seeing AI samples slowly creep into the ecosystem, as mentioned by Berkeley from Emergent Drums before. This could lead to a saturation of the sample pack market, affecting both profitability and discoverability of non-AI traditional samples. After all, expecting someone to pay for a pack when their DAW can generate anything they want on the fly will be a far tougher sale than it is today, especially as these systems become much more context-aware, capable of generating specific musical components that mesh perfectly into the song you're composing. Now, sample packs are one thing, but this also extends to AI that can handle full tracks. 
As mentioned previously, background music may take a hit as many independent creators may opt to just trial and error an AI service for their projects. This isn't too hard to imagine when you see it from their perspective. If they even play a few seconds worth of music that they weren't authorized for, they run the risk of getting a copyright strike on their channel and losing all revenue from that video. Even if that musical sample consists of less than 1% of the actual video's content. This restrictive system isn't doing musicians any favors over the long term, and it's actually a huge selling point on many AI music services. Okay, so the sample pack market and possibly background music may be affected by AI. But why don't we take a look at the streaming services themselves? The current economics of streaming trend towards zero. The more music that is uploaded to these services, the less income there is in general for artists. After all, you can't assume that people won't be uploading AI tracks to streaming platforms. They already are. And while Spotify has tried to remove many of these AI songs, it will be increasingly difficult to spot 100% synthetic tracks. Further, since streaming companies like Apple and Spotify pay a fraction of a cent per stream, divided from a portion of the company's total revenue, this would inevitably go down as more and more music gets uploaded. You can already see this happening when you look at Spotify's dwindling pay rates from 2013 to today. Note, these figures are just from what I can gather online. I've left sources in the description. Pay is not the only issue here. Every day, approximately 60 to 100,000 new tracks are being uploaded to streaming platforms. In the age of AI, this could grow exponentially. If you think it's hard to get on a Spotify playlist now, wait until we're at a point where AI music is being uploaded in far greater numbers. The outliers here will be artists with large followings who can make the majority of their income off of live shows, merch, and brand integrations. This aspect of the music industry is not going away anytime soon, but there is very few artists today who can comfortably make their living off of only tours and brand deals as this lifestyle is usually only afforded to the top 1% of artists. Of course, this doesn't mean that a musician using varying degrees of AI to make their music can't achieve similar success. In the world of Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube, who you are matters. And one day we may end up seeing high profile influencers start expressing themselves through AI music, either by using AI components or as the tech progresses, 100% AI generated. The open question remains here. Will their fans accept it? I personally don't know the answer to this, but we've seen influencers branch out into entirely different industries, and many of them have started music and art careers with varying degrees of success. So I'll leave that one up to you. Look, I wanted to do this research to figure out how we got here, see how musicians have handled new tech, and to try and see where we may be going. And to be honest, I'm conflicted. On one hand, the fact that anyone can produce a hit song with only a computer and a set of headphones is a good thing. Technology has enabled every producer to make it in the music industry regardless of where they come from. I mean, if people still had to spend over 100k just to have a synth, or had to be closely tied to a large record label to have a breakout song, the vast majority of producers out there wouldn't exist. And AI seems to be a hyper acceleration of this same principle as in it'll let even more people get involved in music production. But the best producers will be those who know how to harness it. When you end up in a situation where far more people can get involved in music, this has always brought with it more variety. Now on the other hand, I see how different the landscape will be. In an ocean of music, it's going to be much harder to be discovered, even more so than it is today. Meaning that for those of you who want to live off of this, it's going to be increasingly important to get your music heard and find the others who appreciate it. Because no matter how good AI gets, people will still want to go to music festivals and people will still want to go to concerts or orchestras or even just to see their local bands. None of this is going away. But the way I see it is you should be using every tool available to you because if you don't, someone else will. Anyways, that just about wraps this up. I just want to say thanks for coming on this journey with me. It was pretty eye-opening looking at how much everything has changed, and I really did enjoy making this. 
As mentioned, I have plans to look at synthesized vocals along with a few other topics that came across while researching, so I'd appreciate a sub and a share, especially since this is a new channel. But let me know your thoughts. Do you agree with me? Do you not? Put in the comments and I'll try to be down there as much as possible. Once again, too, this is just my opinion and no one can really tell the future, so I'm curious on how you view AI when it comes down to music. And with that, have a great day and I'll see you all soon. Cheers.